Mama Kai Sanders, welcome to the Plant Yourself podcast. Yay, thank you so much. Yeah, so um, we're, we're going to be talking about, um, about your, your mission. Um, so let's, let's just start by having you share what it is. All righty. Well, first of all, it's another amazing day in paradise. I got to make sure I say that. <laughs> Uh, that's your that's your that's your superpower tagline, huh? That's my superpower tagline. <laughs> I could I could use a little bit of that because I, I actually have moved to what you know it's kind of paradise in many ways, and but I can get up and just just see you know the dog turn on the sidewalk and <laughs> you know and do the the truck you know blowing exhaust fumes, and I can totally forget that life is good. So. I love that discipline of uh, reminding myself. Another beautiful day in paradise. Absolutely. You just got to put your own spin on it. But for me, it's another amazing day in paradise. Um, I'm so honored to be able to um, speak with you today. Um, just a little bit of background about me. My given name is Cara Lynn Sanders. I didn't come into the world as a mama. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you, you've, you've earned that one. Huh? I, I definitely earned that one. Uh, my nickname is Kai, but I tell people that my super shero name is Mama Kai because I found my superpowers being the mom of a young black male superhero. And so he is really um, the reason for everything that I do. Um, I've, I always wanted to be a mom, I feel like, because I was the oldest of six children growing up in my mom's home. Five girls, one boy. You can imagine the dynamics there. <laughs> Uh -huh. <laughs> probably not <laughs> that's probably a good thing but it was there were a lot of hormones let's just put it that way <laughs> okay <laughs> and um just recently we've been on this incredible adventure through the perils of poverty um experiencing life um unhoused um, without stable housing and i've watched him flourish um, the name God gave him when he was when I was pregnant is wisdom. And he told me it wasn't mm. going to be for the things he would learn, but for the things he would teach. And so I've endeavored to not just be his first and best teacher, but his first and best student. And I've watched um, I've watched this young black male superhero flourish in the midst of adversity, and I wanted to know why. And so I got curious. and um I started, I've been taking um, classes and last year I finished my parent coach training with the Jai Institute for Parenting. And when I learned about brain development, nervous system regulation, and then through more personal development, learned more about trauma and through the parent, the plant-based coaching certification, which led me to the plant-based certification, uh, coaching certification where we met, um, that added the element of nutrition and understanding mm -hmm what's going on in our heads, what's going on in our bodies and how are they connected? And so I am in the midst of developing a program that's called, How Does Your Garden Grow? It is to create homesteads for those who are unhoused and to provide not just physical services of having a home, but learning how to be at home within yourself by understanding how does the garden of your brain grow? Because nobody tells you that and you don't have any control over that because it happens in the first seven years of your life approximately. And so when they say your brain is like a sponge, it is literally, it's more like this, this field with fertile ground and whatever seeds are thrown there grow. Mm. And so many of us grow up and not know why we behave the way we do, why we choose the things we choose. And so in order to eliminate homelessness internally and externally, then people deserve the opportunity to know how did your brain grow? What's in there? What needs to be weeded out? And what do you want to plant in its, in its, in its place? Hmm. Wow, there's, there's so much on the... Uh... Like the interviewer in me is like having a mini panic attack. Like, what question do I ask next? You just you set such a huge buffet. Um, but I guess I want to start with you know you said like this this adventure 
in the, through the perils of poverty. So a little part of my brain just exploded there. Like, like there's, there's some contradictions that we need to unpack, right? You said you're, you're unhoused. Mm -hmm. um, so what, you know, one of the reasons I was stuttering at the beginning is I don't even know the right terms. Any, like is homeless, not, a, you know, unhoused. So I want to kind of let you tell the story, but can you give us some background? So, yeah, absolutely. So there's a lot of different ways that you can describe people without stable housing. You can say unhoused, you can say homeless. Um, I particularly use unhoused to describe me only because I feel at home with myself and home is wherever me and my son are together. And so that's why I don't use that we are homeless, that we are unhoused. But from the experiences that I've had, I see that there are a lot of people who are not at home with themselves and are not don't have a, a home to go home to. And so um, that helps. That's what how I define being homeless. And so there mm. are some people who are homeless, who are without housing, that are at home with them, themselves. Um, but there are a lot more who are not at home with a physical um, dwelling or within their own existence, you know? So that's how I use those words, those, those terms. Gotcha. Can, can I ask you about your, uh, your situation? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so about four years ago, um, my son and I returned to North Carolina thinking I had paternal support and um, it was more conversation and um, and a lot, not a lot of implementation. And so we ended up without stable housing and have kind of been on this experience of navigating the systems that exist to figure out how to become stable. And it was my personal spirit does not mesh well with um, with people who with with feeling uncomfortable with feeling um, with especially because I was struggling so much with just recognizing my own value that I wasn't willing to allow um, other people to feel to I wasn't I wasn't comfortable being in spaces where I felt like I was of less value. And so I, I, I hesitate with the words I use because we spend so much time placing blame on other people for the way we make, they make us feel, but people can't make us feel any kind of way. We get to choose that. And so I try to take responsibility for the feelings that I was having, recognizing that the actions of other people can spark something within you but then you have to develop. You have to um, develop the 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 means of saying, okay, I'm feeling some kind of way about that. What is the feeling, and what is the need behind that feeling? And so there was uh -huh. simply a need to be felt re feel respected, despite my financial situation, and I didn't feel that. And so mm. um, as I meaning, meaning na navigating the systems that are supposedly set up to help. They don't very well. You have to you have to very much submit yourself and mm -hmm. you may not get the help that you actually need. You will get what you are provided. <laughs> and if that doesn't work for you, then you aren't then you're really not welcome there because unfortunately so many organizations not through their own fault, but just through the fault of the way things have developed, they're looking for numbers. And their numbers determine their success, their numbers determine their funding, whether they'll be able to continue you know, with programs and different things of that nature. So I, I, I eventually didn't take it so personally. I just couldn't, I just couldn't um, submit myself to the things that were uncomfortable. And it was mostly this idea that you're here to serve, like I'm here to serve them versus they're in service to me because they're getting paid to be in service to, you know, what I need and to help me to accomplish the things that I'm looking to accomplish. And um, yeah. yeah, you can you can know that people, the way people treat you is, is their projection and still 
you know, it's an avalanche. It can, and, you know, especially when it when it reminds us of, you know, the stories that are the, the weeds that were planted. You know, it's like fertilizer for that one. Absolutely agreed. And so we just we just did what we could do. And most recently, um, we were invited to stay someplace j during the month of July. And um, it was supposed to be for about three weeks. And I spent four days moving in. On the fifth day, we were told we needed to leave by 11 o'clock on the sixth day. And it was because the person, um, they tried to get me to, to sign a legal document that they hadn't asked me to sign or notified me in advance that I needed to sign. They waited for me, me and my son to move in and then sent it via email late at night. And when I responded to it, they didn't appreciate it and felt that because I... Um, because I called them out and said, you did not ask me to sign this. And I think it's illegal for you to do it. That because I dared to have feelings about it, they personally came down and because it was a basement apartment and told, um, and told me that I was ungrateful and that I didn't recognize because they weren't offering me a, ratch, a roach infested place to stay that um, I should have just signed the document. And I was like, hmm. And so um, at that point, I decided that it was more important for me to focus on eliminating homelessness because it has been a passion of mine and I could focus on keeping a roof over our heads um, and, or I could focus on, um, I could focus on bringing brain development, nervous system regulation, trauma and nutrition to the forefront as the need, the basic needs for people who are unhoused so that we can actually work towards eliminating it and moving people from poverty to prosperity instead of moving people from one level of poverty to another and thinking that that's sufficient. I think a lot of the problems that we have nowadays, we think with, especially with um, what we call the housing crisis, the reality is, is that there's enough housing. It's just that so much of it has become out of the reach of the, of people who are who are just genuine, genuinely living, who aren't, um, who aren't um, versed in a in a particular career that will provide the income that they want or need, and so, but we keep in, instead of trying to help people advance in their careers, advance in their lives, and um, be able to hand gain more finances, we continue to keep people at a level of um, at, at a level of, of poverty, you know, of, of either at, on, or below the poverty line. And um, it's just unfortunate because the reason for that is because we literally have a system that is built upon needing people to be unhoused and food insecure for other people to be housed and food secure. Can you um, connect those dots? Yeah. How does that how does that work? So I so one of the things that I I did was there's a um there's an online re online resource that you can look up the um the financial records of nonprofits because in the United States it's public record. These are public organizations, they serve the public, and so their records are a pub are you know, their tax records are of public notice. So I did took the opportunity to look up um some of the organizations specifically in our area, but also some of the national organizations that are addressing um, homelessness. And in the city of Raleigh, out of 10 organizations, um, they are addressing either food or housing insecurity. And of those 10 organizations, there was only one where the executive director and nobody on the board made anything. Other than that, the least amount a person was paid was just under $70,000 a year. The highest was a six figure salary around 130K. Um, then I looked at, there was one, one or, national organization that I looked at in particular, and they don't even have direct, they don't even do direct uh, 
frontline services. They work more along the lines of the political arena to focus on how to change policy and things of that nature. And the top executive um, who within the last year or so um, has left and been replaced, but they were making over $200,000 a year. And mm -hmm. all the top executives um, that were listed were making over a hundred thousand dollars. And I was like, these six or seven people are making a million dollars a year, which could put an enormous amount of people in homes, you know, at least in Raleigh, I know it could, you know, um, in homes for at least a year. And if you're talking like tiny homes or um, some of these kit homes, you're talking, you could put people in homes that they be that belong to them for a lifetime you know? And so we literally have a system that is built upon the need for people to be unhoused and food insecure because donations come into those organizations. That's how they, that's how they exist. Federal funding comes into those organizations, city and state and county funding goes into these organizations. And so there's a lot of money generated to keep um, from, because of the goodness of people, but that goodness of people to that supports these organizations ends up keeping more people unhoused and food insecure because the money is not actually spent towards building housing and putting um, programs into place that will move people from poverty to prosperity, but it actually keeps most of them in, in, in poverty. I see. see so, so where, where are you living now? Um, well, we had a blessing of staying in a hotel last night, but we live in our car right now. Uh -huh. Can I ask what that's like? It's an adventure. One of the beautiful things is we wake up to the sunshine, you know, or, or the rain. It could be a rainy day, but we've had a lot of sunshine. Um, we've lived by the, the kindness and grace of a lot of people, but and I continue to speak out um, on what needs to be done in order to move people in the direction that our world needs to go. Um, we generally will spend um, a couple of hours at a park. Um, and within Raleigh, there's, you know, more than more than 50 parks. We've been to the vast majority of them. We actually have a map of um of the park system and so if we haven't been to a park then we there's a there's a park that we um will choose to go to to visit it so my son and i have both tagged our favorites you know, <laughs> you know there's uh, one in particular that i like and he's like i don't want to go there it's not so much fun you know <laughs> so there's that's been like the best thing because when we're in we tend to stay in and we're very focused on you know, being in the house and doing things and stuff like that. So being outside, especially at this time of year, it it has been a blessing for us, I will say, even though most people won't won't feel that way. Um, we use whatever facilities we can. We have a great parks and rec system. So many of the community centers have showers and things of that nature. We've been blessed with people who will open their homes to us, you know, to use shower facilities and stuff like that. Um, and so the biggest challenge has definitely been access to food because we don't have a refrigerator. And so, mm. but other than that, it's just, it's an amazing adventure. It really is. And, and I say that only because it's, for us, it's a choice. Cause I did talk to my son about it. And for us, it's a choice. It's a way that I know that I'm able to regulate my nervous system um, by living in this experience. And that's really important to me because a lot of people, because when you're live, dealing with the stress of trying to keep a room over your head, especially for me being, knowing so much information, but knowing that it takes time to build connection and community and things of that nature, um, I'd rather be spending my time building connections and community and um, providing information and giving people something else to think about than trying to um, to focus on keeping a hotel room over our head for now um, because that the stress of doing that doesn't allow me to live me or my son to live our best lives it's a very stressful yeah. and um, and at times it could be very demeaning you know thankfully we've had a lot of great experiences but there are the few that that 
that I had just have to sit back and and breathe in like the one that happened in July um at the end of the day it was never about me not signing the agreement it was about this young lady's inability to um to have the confidence to simply ask me you know I got uncomfortable once I once you were here and if you would just sign this it would make me feel can we talk about this is this something you're comfortable with you know and because she couldn't do that, her trauma response was, I need to control the situation, so I need you out of my house. You're not doing what I need you to do. And it was a reflection of how she was parented, you know? And so I didn't take it personally. Thankfully, because of my training, I could see that. Um, it didn't change the dynamics of the situation, but I knew that if I had signed that, I would one always wonder what she felt she could get away with next, you know? Mm -hmm. And so it wasn't a safe place for my nervous system, even if it was a safe yeah. place for my physical experience, you know? Yeah. Can I ask, how old is your son? He is seven and a half. Uh-huh. Gotcha. Is, is he in the car with you now? He's not. He's actually in the hotel room sleeping right now. Thankfully, the window is right behind me, so he can look out and see, but he's he'll be asleep for at least another hour. <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> Do, do you homeschool or is he going to have to figure out? I do. We do some child led learning and he, I mean, he learned to read while he was, when he was four and we weren't, we uh, weren't housed at that time. We were here in North Carolina. And so um, he continues to amaze people. He, I call him a great debater. We've, we really shine in the confidence arena and we're learning how to be humble. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> but it is my greatest honor and privilege to be his mom and his student. Wow. wow. Um, let's let's shift to talk about solutions. Mm -hmm. um, so I have ideas in my head about what you mean by sort of you know, trauma response and neural regulation, and I'm thinking about. Um, you know, polyvagal theory and and things like that. Can you can you kind of paint, paint the picture so that I know that we're talking about the same sorts of things or yeah. where 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 I need to learn from you? Absolutely. And and I continue to learn from you. When I was going through my parent coach training, when I learned about brain development and nervous system regulation, when I learned about polyvagal theory and this fascinating nerve that runs from the gut to the brain, you know, and then through, um, it was actually through Goodness Lover that I learned more about the microbiome. Um, and there was something in one of their series that said, um, where one of the speakers was talking about how we come from hunter gatherer. It actually might've been Dr. Gabor Mate, who's like one of my, um, he's one of my favorites. Um, I think it was him who speaks a lot about our hunter gatherer instincts and how we all live out of our nervous systems first. And we have to tap, um, if we're ever presented with a situation where we feel threatened, whether that threat is real or perceived, our nervous system will react first. And then our intellect will kick in. And I was like, just all this information, this uh, the idea that we've got this gut, this microbiome that has food that goes into it, it regulates this, you know, as part of the regulation system for this vagus nerve that runs to our brain, that the foods that we eat could alter the way our brain is going to experience a situation, you know, if we've had, um, if we have a healthy gut, that the, our gut will produce, you know, a more regulated nervous um nervous system and for those who don't understand um, or might be new to you know nervous system regulation with polyvagal theory which you mentioned um, um, Dr. Porges he breaks it our nervous system up into three levels which is ventral vagal sympathetic and dorsal vagal and the way that I like to use layman's terms is rest and digest that's where you're able to get some good sleep your food is able to digest and you're able to relax and you're able to as far as your brain is concerned you're actually able to tap into that ex what they call the executive front um executive function or your prefrontal cortex which is where like your reasoning skills like those the things that you use like the, 
your higher brain. Um, and then there's sympathetic, which most people are familiar with as fight or flight. And that's where when you're presented with a situation, you literally, you either fight or flight. Like you're going to go head to head against this situation or you're running as far away from it as you can so you don't have to deal with it. And then there's another one that's called dorsal vagal. And that's like where you're living in your lowest vibration that when a situation hits that you freeze or you get into, they, they call it freeze or fawn. And from what I understand about fawn is like where you get into this very people pleasing mode where you're like, you're doing whatever you can to appease everybody else, regardless of how it compromises who you are. But that's your attempt to feel safe. Mm. You know, yeah, somebody, I was talking to somebody yesterday who called it please and appease, mm. which I'd never heard, which I'd never heard before. But yeah, that, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so the fascinating thing that I realized is that what we're missing in, in helping our neighbors who are unhoused is that they are literally living out of the brilliance of their nervous system to keep them safe. Mm. Even if we don't like it. So the mental illness, the drugs, the alcohol, the promiscuity, the fighting, even if we don't like it, based on how their brains were developed, that is their attempt to keep themselves safe when they're living out of their sympathetic nervous system or worse, you know, their, their dorsal vagal that, you know, freeze or fawn or, um, or what did you say? The plea, the please, the peas. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, I, I most, for most people, the dorsal vagal is just sort of a, a collapse. Yeah. Right. It's like a it's like a permanent state of depression, wet blanket. Right. And it was it was evolutionarily when you're in the grip of the predator's mouth, if you go limp and dissociate, either your death will be less bad or maybe it, it'll think you've died and it doesn't it's no longer interested in you. So it's a kind of it's a it's a kind of reaction to imminent destruction powerful that our nervous systems are reacting to something that happened thousands of years ago millennia yeah. you know but here we are experiencing that with entirely new situations and it all gets developed in a short span of time that we have no control over we have no control over it unless we're presented with new information to create new habits, which will create new lives. And that's where, you know, that beautiful thing called neuroplasticity, where the brain can change or you can develop these new neural pathways is so beautiful. But if people aren't given the opportunity for to have that information, because that was what it was for me when I took my parent coaching um, course, is when I was learning this information on how to best navigate life with my son, I learned about me. Like mm. the few pictures that I could remember of my childhood, I was like, oh my gosh, I get it now, you know? But that didn't change the fact that I still had these tendencies that weren't serving me in the best way and as I, I knew I was doing something right because I have this incredible young man that I'm watching grow and be so different from me and have qualities that I want. And so I focused on doing my very best for him, but also learning from him and saying, okay, well, if he can do that, I can do it too, you know? And because I was a fraidy cat, I was, <laughs> I lacked confidence. Um, even if I knew something, I was afraid to speak up. And it still shows up every once in a while now. But I remember just one day, like, just talking to God and saying, you know, I can't do this. And he said, you don't have to be fearless. I just need you to choose to be courageous today. 
I just need you to mm. use courage today. And at, for every opportunity that I've chosen courage, that I've chosen to be courageous to speak out, it has never worked against me. And so that's what's increased my confidence. And so that's where I know I'm like creating a new neural pathway in my brain that says, mm. you know, no, you're you're brilliant. You're an expert. You're you are part of you are um, you're not the exception. You're the rule, you know, and mm. everybody else deserves to have that opportunity to learn about their brilliance to learn that they're an expert at something. And that came from, um, I just keep that in mind because Joy Spencer, she's the executive director of an organization called Equity Before Birth. And she speaks to that, that, you know, we don't, we can't look at people and judge them. Everybody is an expert at something. And if they're given the right tools to hone their craft, that in a direction that will serve humanity, we will see their brilliance take, take flight. You know, but we don't. We judge people. We don't like that you do that. And so, instead of building people, we we tend to we tend to break them. Yeah, one one of the lessons that Gabor Mate has taught me so beautifully is really that that every behavior makes sense. That everything, no matter what someone's doing, no matter how much I don't like it, no matter how much it might be hurting me, it's their attempt to take some medicine to deal with their own trauma. Yes. And and go ahead. Yeah. Well, it's hard, you know, at that point, you know, there's, there's, and now I'm doing another form of, of learning around, you know, coherence therapy, which takes that to, you know, another level sort of, you know, in, in terms of um, my understanding of the brain. And one of the things I've, I've actually struggled to, give up or hold on to is judgment. It's like, like there's something very nice about being able to judge people and dismiss them that makes my life easier. And I'm like, I don't, you know, I don't want to necessarily, not every part of me wants to give that up. Like if I can judge people for being impoverished or homeless or, or panhandling or less, then it's not my responsibility. Like, well, they, something happened they you know absolutely i i totally respect that and i think what's important is that it's okay for us to judge it's just like it's okay for us to be angry it's what we do with that you know it's what we do with that can we sit with that and honor it and say where does this come from and what need of mine isn't being met because I'm seeing that. And because at Jai, we teach something different. We teach something very similar to what Dr. Gabor Mate is saying. Um, and he, we say that every behavior, you know, every emotion is an attempt to get a need met, you know, whether, um, whether it's, you know, elation, you know, um, whether it's elation or devastation, you know, like every behavior, when a child is running around and giggling and happy, you know, um, that there, there's a, there's a need, um, behind that behavior, you know, they're, they want to celebrate, you know, they want to connect, you know, and stuff like that, or they're connecting with you and, you know, their need is for joy and happiness. But when that child is throwing something, you know, we want to be like, that's bad. You shouldn't do that. So many of us, because of how we were trained, you know, it's, it's really, we are dealing with our subconscious conditioning and our subconscious conditioning is literally a threat and often an enemy to the conscious person that we're, we're trying to become. Because when we get that information and we want to live this new life, when we get thrown into situations that make us feel uncomfortable, we automatically go back to that subconscious conditioning that um fight or flight response you know and so i want just want to support you and say judgment is not bad we all do it mm. it's what we then do with that judgment that matters yeah I'm, I'm learning from a therapist named alan parry out of the uk and he talks about our invisible twin the like 
each of us, like, I want to behave in this way, in this situation. I want to be loving and confident and kind and generous. And there's some, like, it's like an invisible twin that says, no, that's too dangerous. That is going to get you in trouble. That's unacceptable. And until we get to know the invisible twin and what it's scared of and really befriend it and honor it for, you know, the warnings that it's giving us and really look at what did we learn? Like, what was what was our data set? Right. You had a childhood data set. I had a childhood data set. Speaking for myself, my family of origin was not at all like the world I live in now, but I'm still operating on those rules. And and the only thing I could do is try to make that twin visible and say, okay, so what what really, you know, are, is going on here? No, I, oh my goodness. <laughs> That's a great way to speak about it. Um, there's somebody else who speaks on it and I can't remember his name. I know he does IFF and I think it's like interfamily oh, Richard Schwartz. or something. Yes, yes. Dick Schwartz, yeah, yeah, internal family systems. Yeah, sure. that's that was my introduction to this to this world. Yeah, because he talked about that other person, you know, and like letting that person come through and speak and what are they saying and stuff like that. And yeah, that's our subconscious conditioning, you know, wanting to wanting to keep us safe. You know, like, no, your parents said this. And we don't even realize that that's what it's coming from. Like, the vast majority of the world does not realize that that's what we operate out of. We don't operate out of our conscious minds. when, And we don't even, half the time, we don't even know when we're, when we feel threatened. You know, like, <laughs> we just, yeah. you know, because we're so disconnected yeah, well, from our bodies. I don't and, I don't like to feel fear. I'd rather feel judgment, anger, rage, superiority. Those those feel damn good. <laughs> and it's important that you, that you ex experience that and claim that and be like, yeah, okay, now. <laughs> What's the need behind that? Is it because I was always m made to feel inferior? You know, was I always mm -hmm. judged? And so now I have the power to make that judgment. You know, where is this? Where, what's the need that that is manifesting in those moments for yourself? You know, well, I've worked so hard to get myself to this position and I did it all by myself. So they need to pull up their bootstraps and do it, th do it too, you know? And so it's, it's real, you know, we have that, we, we have this battle that's constantly going on. And, and for me, that's where I want to make, help people to get to the point where their subconscious conditioning and their conscious minds can live in harmony with one another, you know, mm -hmm. that they can honor one another. And the more that we can help people develop new neural pathways, the more that is possible. And then the subconscious conditioning can become more along the lines of our conscious conditioning, you know? Yeah, yeah. So Kit, let's, um, I, have to, I have to jump off a little bit before the top of the hour for a thing. Um, I do wanna have more conversations with you, but for, for now, I'd love to hear about the, the homesteads. Like what's, what is that about? And what, what's your vision for, or what could be. Yeah, thank you. Um, so a homestead is usually an off grid. You know, people live away from the city, they live off the land and things of that nature. Um, and so my vision is to create a space where people, where we minimize the um, utility payments for people. So rain catchment systems, solar panels. Actually, like the thing that I want the most is a green powerhouse. I don't know if you're familiar with the need of need to grow in Michael Smith. Oh my goodness. No. So Michael Smith um, created this structure and it is it can it is zero carbon, I wanna say. You can grow food inside, like up to a quarter acre of food, and it could power like a hundred homes. And it is completely green energy. And, and, and it's for sale for a million dollars right now, which I don't have, but that's okay. Like, but I see this as like the green energy of the future. They, it, you, you have to see this. It is just amazing. But I learned about it in the need to grow the movie that, um, Rob Herring from earth conscious films put out in conjunction with the food revolution network. 
So that would be ideal. Um, but the idea for the homestead in particular for the way it would help people is first it would put them in home. It would get, we would um, have both communal and personal gardens so that people can um, learn how to grow food so that they can become food secure. Outside of that, it would also team up with the program that I mentioned at the top of the, at the beginning of the conversation called How Does Your Garden Grow? So they're not just learning how to grow food, but they're learning about the garden of their mind. And, mm -hmm. and so they can determine, okay, I know this is in there. I know this is in there. For so many people, anger is a huge component. And so we don't want people to, to, to just try to rip out anger because anger means that there's a need that needs to be met. But we want people to be able to tap into that to that need and find out what's behind the anger, you know, and where is it stemming from? Is that anger actually stemming from this moment, this exact experience or mm. excuse me, is it stemming from some other experience? And this is kind of the culmination where you just got you're tired of feeling this way because you never addressed it before you know? And so um, there's that. And then another aspect of it is that people get paid for their experience. Because when you're unhoused, one of the biggest, um, one of the biggest barriers to employment is when you don't have an employment record, you know, or well, what were you doing during this time? And then you've got this question. So if we can help people get established, we can pay them for their, for the work that they're doing, you know, um, then the other thing that is so important to me is, um, and it's actually kind of the foundation, is that people keep a gratitude journal for, a, for the first six weeks, at least for the first six weeks. And then I'm looking at other things that they can tra transition into to be able to continue keeping a journal. But the importance of the gratitude journal in particular, which is, just, which is writing down five things every day, um, focusing on being grateful for things that are challenging to you, minimally being grateful for things that you anticipate, and also not repeating anything for at least two weeks. But the idea is that if you want to change your life, you've got to change your mind. And that's not just about making a, a different decision. It is literally about changing how your mind operates. And that's one of the ways to create a new neural pathway of looking at your life from a more positive perspective, because we are not designed to look at things positively, naturally. And if we then have the influx of our subconscious conditioning where our parents were always, don't do that, don't stop, blah, blah, you know, then we are, we are generally trained to look for the negative. So we have to retrain our brains. We literally have to re retrain or train our brains to think of things in a more positive light. And so once we can look at our situations positively, then we can believe that there is a possibility for change. And the idea is to move people from surviving to thriving, from poverty to prosperity internally and externally. Um, another aspect that for me is extremely important is mentorship, that everybody has a mentor, somebody who can see their brilliance despite their bank account and hold a vision of life beyond homelessness for them. Anybody mm. who is endeavoring to do anything usually has a coach, a plant-based coaching certification. You know, you're trying to move to, you know, more of a plant-based lifestyle. So you're going to get a coach. If You know, you're going to get a coach, a life coach. You're going to get a business coach. You know, why aren't there mentors to help people move from, move out of homelessness? It doesn't make any mm. sense because people don't expect people to move out of poverty. And so that is another. Oh, it's just, and, it's, and, it's, and it's really hard to monetize helping people who don't have lots of money. And, and that's the thing that fascinates me because of all the things, like we throw out this thing, hurt people, hurt people, you know, but I also know that help hurt people, help people. You know, I mm. heard somebody say that. And the reason why hurt people hurt people is because they've been hurt. But a lot of hurt people have always have, are, have also been helped and they want to be helpful. 
And so when we can help people move from poverty to prosperity, that's where the monetization comes in because they'll then turn around and pour back into the pour back into the organization that that supported them in that endeavor, or they'll pay it forward into the world by creating something beautiful that the world is is missing, or they'll be able to support something that is already happening that needs the support and doesn't have it. We are missing a key component of not helping people move from poverty to prosperity, especially internally, so that they then can give their gifts to the world and be a blessing to other people. One of the things that I find fascinating about your approach and so beautiful is you're combining sort of personal responsibility with systems change. But you're not, you know, you're not saying it's all your state if you change, you know, which can come across as blaming, like, well, if you're if you just change your state, then you could, you know, manifest riches, right? And you're also not saying we just have to spread wealth more equ equitably, or you know, that that's that's a nest. They're both necessary steps, but not sufficient. It's a, you're taking a very systems approach to to this issue. Thank you. I take that as a as a huge compliment because I took a um, a workshop earlier this year that was on systems thinking and I didn't realize it but it one of the words that they use that I'd never heard of is called a mental model and I this is my this process was already in place but what I realized is that I have a different mentality about how to look at people and it's simply the the very first there's there's seven different things in the, in the mental model that I'm creating. But the one thing that's the most important for me is that everybody comes into this world with infinite intrinsic value, that they die with that same value and that nothing in between those two dates changes their value. And so if we can help people live up to, first of all, to recognize that they are a value and then live up and exceed their value and then they give those gifts to the world, which makes the world a better place, then we, we, we create a better world. And that's simply, the simple way that, that I use is that I'm blasting bushels off of their lights. You know, people have had all these buckets put on their lights and we're just, it's just time to, to it's time to blast them off. You know, it's time to blast them off. <sighs> So I gotta run, but I, I, can I can I um, press you to say we can do another one soon? Yeah, absolutely. So, this is fun. I'm okay, so excited so and honored. Thank you. How can people find out more? How is there, are you? Do you have an online presence? Is there? How can people help? I'm working on it. I think the best way to reach out to me is via Instagram. Um, if you go to my Instagram bio, there's I have a digital business card there. Some people use another service, but I found that my digital business card is actually the best way to reach me. And on it, if you click on my digital business card, it literally has everything I'm doing. It has fundraisers. It has my personal contact information. Um, if people want to reach out directly to me, um, you can email me at kai dot t i m e t o l u v because the name of my business is actually called um, Love Enterprises Presents LLC. Um, but um, it's kai.time to love at gmail.com. And just really quickly about love enterprises, love is an acronym. It stands for learn your value. And people are really who are really smart will realize that your doesn't start with you, it starts with a Y. So I use a little phonetic spelling. Mm -hmm. But our motto is building the village, raising the child. And so literally we are building, um, anticipating building physical villages as well as personal villages and raising all children because we are all children of God. And um, all of us have an inner child that can that still needs to be raised. Mm -hmm. So when people are following you, are there things they can do to help? Are there actions to take or? I would say um, I'm hosting some master classes. If people want to get involved um, and just start to change their mentality. I think the first thing is if you don't have a mentality of of the infinite intrinsic value of everybody, that's a great place to start. I feel like all the work that needs to be done can be done personally. I do have a fundraiser. People are more than welcome to contribute to that. Um, 
I also have uh, people, are, I would invite people to keep a gratitude journal just so that they can begin to recognize their own worth if they are struggling with that. Um, and also if you're involved in any way with the homeless community in your area, then I would just say, reach out, say hello, you know, sit down and have a conversation with somebody and realize that we are all part of nature and that we're all connected to one another. So when we dismiss somebody, um, then we are really losing a piece of ourselves. And so if we can mm -hmm. just reach out and give some goodness to everybody as this is, is developing and growing, then it'll be easier to create solutions where uh, all across the world, because this will go global. <laughs> May it be so. That Mama Kai, Carol Sanders, thank you so much for all the work you're doing. I'm so I'm sorry I'm not your neighbor anymore. Um, I'll have to, I'll, we'll have to meet up when I when I head back to uh, to take care of stuff. Um, I'll I'll put the contact information on the digital business card in the show notes so people can find it easily. Um, and we're going to talk again soon. I hope. Absolutely. Thank you again. I'm so honored that. I've had this opportunity and just like serendipity that at the in the very last class that we shared together in the very last breakout room we were able to connect so I'm excited for the yeah. future. <laughs> yeah, the, the honor is mine as well so thank you so much. You're welcome. Continued success Howie. And you. Talk <laughs> to you soon. Bye-bye. <laughs>